Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, very warm welcome to this uh, session of Consumers International Fair Digital Finance Forum. In this session, we're going to be looking at building the digital finance regulation we need. Um, just before we get into the details and then onto the session, um, just a little um, reminder uh, that you're very welcome to uh, add questions or comments um, in the session. And if you could please use the chat function to, to do that, um, um, that will help me to um, direct questions to the panel. And when you're using the chat function, please uh, remember to introduce, say who you are, which organization you're from, and where you're, you know, where, where you're joining from, which jurisdiction you're joining from. That would be very um, interesting and helpful. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so as I said, this session is all about building the digital finance regulation we need. Uh, the, it's part of the Consumers International Fair Digital Finance Forum this year, which obviously coincides with uh, uh, consumer rights, uh, World Consumer Rights Day on uh, its tomorrow. Um, the objectives of this session are to share uh, successful approaches to digital finance regulation that protected and empowered consumers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, particularly, we want to have a think about what have we learned over the last two years and how will this help us mitigate the future challenges on the horizon in the digital uh, finance marketplace. Uh, it very, it's very much, of course, aligned to the overall theme of, the, of this year's forum. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that digitalization has massively increased over the last couple of years in the context of the pandemic and touches the lives of, of almost every consumer uh, wherever they are around the world. If we go to the next slide, please read. So I'm Miles Larby. It's my pleasure to be acting as moderator for this panel. I'm the head of financial consumer protection at the OECD. Um, and I lead the OECD's research, policy, and standard setting work in relation to financial consumer protection, working with governments right around the world, um, OECD, G20, FSB member countries, but also, uh, as I say, countries in every continent around the world. And it's my pleasure uh, to be moderating the session. And uh, at the OECD, we work and collaborate with Consumers International on, um, on relevant topics. And it's our pleasure to, to do that and to support uh, Consumers International in this initiative as part of uh, this year's forum um, and related initiatives as well, for example, the, uh, the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator that I know uh, uh, is going to be showcased uh, during the course of this week. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll just briefly introduce our panellists. I'm delighted to be joined by four excellent panellists from jurisdictions around the world. Uh, we have Kirti Ramsahok Hirasing, Head of Regional Centre of Excellence from the Financial Services Commission of Mauritius. Jose Vasco, who is the Director of Investor Protection and Education at the Securities Commission of Brazil. Supriya Sial, who's the Deputy Commissioner at the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. And Adam Wright, Senior Counsel, California Department of Financial Technology Innovation. So a, a, a really uh, interesting uh, panel with bringing perspectives and experiences from, from countries right around the world um, to uh, explore this issue, issue of the digital financial uh, regulation that we need. Um, I'm just going to start uh, by a few uh, scene setting comments, if you like, uh, drawing on work for, that the OECD has conducted at an international policy level uh, on this topic of digi digitalization and how the experience of the pandemic has perhaps um, accelerated digitalization and some of the impacts of that and how different governments around the world have responded. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Ruby. Um, I'm going to draw from, i just briefly mention some of the highlights from a major piece of work that the OECD conducted last year um, in, um, in collaboration with the G20 to look at the impact of the pandemic on financial consumers and the range of policy measures uh, that were put in place by countries around the world, uh, the lessons learned and the effective approaching. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please, Ruby. The, this report, um, which is available on the OECD website, of course, is the result of a very significant amount of data collection and analysis 
of information that we collected from um, governments from over 80 countries around the world, as you can see on this map, and public authorities in those 80 countries from 160 uh, public authorities from those 81 jurisdictions. So um, a very comprehensive uh, picture of, of the global situation and the global response. And if we go to the next slide, please, Ruby. The first finding I wanted to highlight was, um, as I say, based on all that data collection and analysis, we identified the, 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 the leading risks that were faced by financial consumers arising from the pandemic. And you can see them on this slide. Uh, we've broken these risks down by high income countries and lower middle income countries, because I think there's an interesting picture that emerges that you can see the number one risk for financial consumers in lower middle income countries was reduced financial resilience. Um, for high income countries, the number one risk to consumers identified was vulnerability to uh, financial scams and frauds. Now those risks were, were, mm -hmm. were common across the board, um, but certainly um, you can see the picture of, of different risks arising to consumers. And obviously it reflects in some part the level of infrastructure and policy arrangements in place, as well as um, capacity for, for responding to hardship in, in different countries um, around the world. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, Ruby. Um, obviously one of the most significant impacts from the pandemic was the accelerated digitalization of financial services. And that's obviously the focus of today's session. So again, just by way of background, you can see that um, um, countries told us that uh, increased use of digital financial services, payment or transaction products, digital wallets, QR codes, contactless cards, that was one of the most significant impacts that they saw in over three quarters of responding countries. The limits for contactless payments on cards was increased, uh, sometimes up to 200%. And of course, we can see that digitalization played a very important role in mitigating the impacts of the pandemic because people were able to continue to transact and, and, and access their uh, financial services. But at the same time, uh, there, it of course created uh, the increased risk that people who, who can't or don't want to transact digitally, whether it's because of low digital capability, low financial literacy or lack of access or infrastructure, of course, there's a risk of increased exclusion uh, for those people um, in different places around the world. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Ruby. Um, more than half of countries put in place specific measures to support the financial inclusion of, or the digital financial inclusion of, of, of consumers in their country. Um, that included particularly expanding um, government payment services, both payments to the government and payments from the government. Uh, by means of digital, um, um, digital means. Um, there were uh, new rules brought in on terms of um, you know, your client due diligence requirements to adapt to the digital environment. And the next slide, please, Ruby. Um, we can also see here that a number of policy or regulatory changes were introduced in terms of financial consumer protection. And the most common measure that was introduced were measures to uh, support consumers experiencing financial hardship financial difficulty as a result of the impact of the pandemic, whether it's as a result of job losses, uh, business um, opportunity losses, reduced um, unemployment um, and income levels. Um, and this is obviously a very significant um, um, development um, and one that we think um, is um, very important looking ahead, the, the importance of having quick and responsive um, hardship mechanisms for consumers suffering financial difficulty. Um, and we could just jump to the next slide, please, Ruby. This slide just summarizes the lessons that are summarized in that report. And if we go to the next slide, um, which just in terms of our work um, looking ahead, and I know we're going to also be discussing this uh, through the course of this panel, uh, this report is available on the website, as I say, so I'd encourage people to go and have a look at it. Uh, all of the, the data and the results are there. And importantly, these lessons are going to feed into the review of the G20 OECD high level principles on financial consumer protection that we're currently undertaking. And also inform, and I'd say that the, the, the findings and the research are available to inform the work of, of all other stakeholders and those who want to do deep dives into particular issues that arose um, or are still arising as a result of the pandemic. So 
that's all I wanted to say by terms of scene setting to paint the, the global picture. And now I think we could come to our panel and get some perspectives from panelists on uh, their individual jurisdiction experiences and, and, and the lessons and, and, and the, um, um, they'd like to share with everybody. Um, so let me start by asking, I've got a few questions ready and hopefully we'll have I say, time for questions through the chat, but let me start with this question. Um, thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic, what has been the main impact in your jurisdiction and the key policy responses for financial consumers that were implemented? And in your opinion, what were, or in your experience, what were the main risks that consumers were facing? And I'd like to put this question first to Adam, please, if I may. Adam. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Wright. Uh, I'm an attorney with the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation uh, here in the United States. Uh, I specifically work in the Office of Financial Technology Innovation. And you're right, great question, uh, Miles, and terrific research. Thanks for presenting that. Uh, I, I think we've had we've seen very similar uh, results as your research shows. And I think number one that we've seen is uh, a real need for consumer awareness and education. Uh, in the United States and in the state of California, we've had a number of consumer relief programs that have been launched by the federal government and the California government. And I think given because of all of the news uh, over the last two years about COVID, the war and everything else happening is that it's been difficult, I think, for consumers to understand some of the uh, line level details about some of the changes to lending programs or relief programs that have been available to consumers. And we have felt that uh, one of our primary goals should be to help informing consumers about these new programs. And so we've undertook a number of education efforts uh, in particular to help folks understand uh, some of the new benefits available to, to borrowers, uh, understanding that uh, how they can take advantage of foreclosure programs or for student loan forgiveness programs that have been rolled out throughout the state of California and in the federal government. And it looks like that was a similar research finding that the OECD found as well. And so I think that's definitely something here that we have felt that is really important as a regulator in these times uh, is just making sure that consumers are aware of their options. And we have actually engaged with our licensees. We've engaged with our lenders uh, who are authorized to operate in California to make sure that they are offering these programs to consumers and to make sure that they're making them aware of them. And we've required that as part of our, our examinations and in our oversight of these companies. Uh, and so that's really one of the key takeaways from us. Great, thank you, Adam. And I think that is a really important point um, that um, putting measures in place is only half the story if consumers need to be able to understand them and, and, and use them appropriately. Kirti, um, what was the experience from the Mauritius uh, perspective? Sorry, um, can you hear me, Mice? Yes, yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, I was just muted. Um, so thank you for that uh, robust, like Adam said, uh, terrific uh, presentation and research on, on the digital finance and consumer rights. So one key observation about the COVID pandemic was that it was obviously unforeseen and abrupt when situations like the lockdown was applied in Mauritius. So this meant that the financial systems, particularly the banking and the payment systems had to adapt overnight to the new means of doing business, especially electronically. So basically the consumers at large could not be prepared in advance, nor could there be situations of training or information being provided to them. Therefore, um, in the case of COVID-19, the main situation that arose, especially for Mauritius was that there was an overnight shift from a largely cash-based society to an electronic means with the problem on both sides. Um, that is the consumer side, there was lack of preparedness. And uh, on the merchant side, there was also uh, lack of preparedness who were not fully prepared to go online. Um, at the same time, there was the delivery channel, which was the missing link in Mauritius. So we should not forget that Mauritius is a very small island and uh, therefore online purchase was not uh, something which uh, was a regular practice. So um, in short, the delivery of services uh, was not fully functional. Furthermore, um, during the COVID-19, we went through an overnight lockdown for about three months. And that lockdown meant that 
even the movement of people and the delivery channel were controlled. Um, there were number of, there was a number of disruptions coming in in these areas. And uh, this brings to my other point as well that filling those disruptions, uh, many organizations, business continuity plans did not cater for COVID as there were no free movement of people. Hence, both the consumers and operators had to operate uh, in this situation. Um, also, this brings me to my last point where the, go the government had to come up with the work from home concept. And this was not part of our culture. So it was very difficult for um, people who are less IT skill or technology savvy to adapt to this new culture. So um, coming up to the part where you say, um, who were more, I think you say, uh, who were more vulnerable? So um, in the Mauritian context, we saw that the youngsters were more adaptable to the tools rather than the senior citizens because they were more skilled in IT. And uh, during uh, that time with the um, work from home concept, um, buying everything online. So we had to use more devices and for senior citizens, that was difficult. Um, yeah, I think that brings to my, to the end of your question. Thank you for sharing that, Kirti. Yes, um, that is um, um, that, that issue about the sort of the, the sudden shift to business continuity plans, which probably weren't, um, um, hadn't been developed with this in mind, um, I think is, is an incredibly important um, one. And no doubt the experience of that will inform um, um, how businesses prepare those plans sort of, you know, into the future. And thank you for sharing that insight on the most vulnerable consumers. I, I think that sort of echoes that point about, you know, the, the potential, while this digitalization was of course incredibly important, it also did create this risk of new pockets or, or new um, cohorts of exclusion in populations. Um, which I know we'll explore it, it further in just a moment. Um, uh, Vasco, can I ask for your perspectives from Brazil, please, on, on this question? Thank you very much, Miles, for the question. And also, I'd like to, before I start, I'd like to thank Consumers International and OECD for the invitation. I'm pleased to be here and to hear such a diverse uh, panel with different perspectives. Uh, on my perspective as a securities regulator, I think it's important to mention that uh, the main impact for financial consumers and perhaps investors, uh, retail investors during the pandemics are, I, I think I can mention four. Uh, the first one is the flights to yield instead of the flights to quality, uh, which is more, more common in uncertainty in times in the past, uh, contrary to our assumptions, we saw a huge number of retail investors trying to invest in, right, in riskier investments during the pandemics, even during the worst uh, times. In Brazil, for example, uh, we moved from 500,000 investors, retail investors in the stock exchange to 5 million investors in just two years. So it's an unprecedented in scale and uh, uh, clearly, investors were looking for uh, high, uh, riskier investments. There also another point that I think it's important: it's gamification of investing or financial services. Uh, this is partly due to the uh, the fact that the broken dealers and even financial institutions are. Uh, offering actually some services for free. So commissions have fallen or been eliminated at all. And apps and trading platforms are making investment easy. So with that, uh, the incentives changed. So there is a huge incentive for trading. And of course, the financial service needs to be paid by the end of the day. So the, there are different incentives with new participants uh, actually paying for the flow of orders. Uh, so a lot of incentives to people to trade, even in some investments that are not good for themselves. So we saw the main stock uh, uh, phenomenon during the COVID. I can mention, I think it's 
well known the GameStop uh, uh, surge in 2021, last year. SEC uh, published a report on the causes of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, phenomenon and how to address it. There are some considerations about market infrastructure incentives that are very good, but just to mention that the, the, the investors uh, that were trading options uh, moved from 58 million US dollars on January I, is it, I'm not sure if it's just me, but um, Vasco, you seem to have frozen. Yeah, I think we've lost Vasco Mars. I'll try and work out um, in the background. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, um, I think we got a couple of um, key insights from Vasco though before that happened, which is very interesting. And um, I, what I want to do is is, is um, drill into this a bit further and come to you, Supriya. Uh, Kirti, you, you touched on this issue about consumers who may have been uh, particularly vulnerable or, or considered to be more vulnerable as a result of the uh, impacts of COVID-19 on their personal financial situation. Um, Supriya, I was just wondering if you could share with us your perspective on that from, from Canada, please. Thank you. Um, and I also, I'll also say thank you for inviting me uh, to this session. Pleasure to be here with all of you. I work uh, for the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. Our mandate is to protect financial consumers. So. We have been closely monitoring changes in Canadians' financial well-being through the pandemic uh, through a monthly nationally representative survey that we started in August of 2020 and continue, con continue to field to this day and intend to continue fielding until uh, the after times of this pandemic. One day they will come. Um, and our findings show a significant impact of the pandemic on all Canadians, uh, much, you know, as, as other speakers were alluding to, specific to um, vulnerable populations, I'll say two things. So first, about one fifth of Canadians report that they have been affected by a bank branch closure. Now, it is generally true that it is lower income or more vulnerable consumers, such as uh, those with a disability, who are most affected by bank branch closures. And that is what we find in our data linked to the pandemic as well. Uh, and as you were saying uh, at the beginning, Miles, the pandemic, of course, has accelerated the move to digital. It was already occurring, but is as you know, is sort of the pandemic has acted as a catalyst, if you will. Uh, and, and while digital banking, of course, brings many benefits, it is typically also true that vulnerable groups, such as those with low digital access or low digital literacy seniors, for example, are the people who are most likely to bank in branch. And those are the groups that get left behind. Second thing I'll say is while over half of Canadians report an increase uh, in stress linked to their finances, this was especially true among women in, in our surveys uh, and also people, others with you know, part-time or precarious work which again, I'll say is not surprising because economic shutdowns and slowdowns most often impact people already living on low incomes and women in particular are more likely to work in fields with precarious positions and low incomes. Last thing I'll say is uh, we, you know, we think of financial vulnerability as a state rather than a trait uh, and any and all demographics you know, can find themselves in a state of vulnerability as this pandemic has revealed. At the same time, systemic barriers have led to some groups being especially susceptible to negative financial outcomes. And those are the groups we see as the most vulnerable in, in the data that we have. So um, we continue to manage, monitor, share our data with uh, well, well, anybody, anybody who wants it uh, so that we can collectively learn and, and adapt our approaches. Thanks, Supriya. Um, and that's a very generous offer to share your data and maybe some of the, the uh, attendees on the call might, might want to get in touch with you because um, having data is just so important. Um, and interesting, uh, not, I guess, surprising that you, um, um, Kirti and, and yourself have both mentioned um, people with low access, digital literacy, um, particularly elderly in terms of this digital um, um, transformation, if you like, or acceleration as a result of, of the pandemic. Um, 
I want to sort of stick on this theme of sort of the response to the pandemic, but perhaps now um, look more at the role or, or your experiences of industry responding to the pandemic and, and sort of certainly from the viewpoint as a as a regulator or a conduct supervisor. Um, one of the things that we found in our research was that you know, many uh, governments, supervisors and industry participants or industry associations work together in some ways to try and ensure that the, the response to the pandemic was coordinated. But of course, a lot of the frontline measures were being um, implemented by um, industry participants and, and Adam has already highlighted the issue of perhaps measures being implemented and the consumer understanding of that. Um, I want to ask um, about the what have you seen in terms of um, really positive responses from industry participants in terms of assisting consumers during the pandemic? And of course, conversely, and as a supervisor, this is sort of goes with the territory. Have you seen any instances of, of misconduct or unfair practices from industry participants um, um, sort of in, in this sort of context? And Supriya, I'd like to sort of um, continue with you on this question first, if, if I may. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Miles. So we've been encouraging our regulated entities, banks, to find ways to ensure that consumers continue to have access to financial services at, at reasonable cost. So early in the, in, in the pandemic, at the behest of the Minister of Finance here in Canada, banks in Canada provided a number of relief measures. And we, FCSE, uh, asked for and received weekly data reports from the regulated entities on these measures, so uh, a few pieces of data, you know, payment deferrals were granted on 775,000 mortgages, lowered interest rates, fee refunds, or payment deferrals on about 650,000 credit cards, payment deferrals or lowered interest rates on around 500,000 auto loans, personal loans, or lines of credit. So the data we received from the banks also show that while each regulated entity had its own qualifying criteria, consumer requests were generally approved in, in a timely manner. Most consumers who applied for financial assistance from a bank received it in, in some way, uh, provided you know, their account was in good standing and they self-declared that they had been negatively impacted. Now, in addition to the data that the banks gave us, we also conducted a monthly survey to understand consumers' use of banking products and services. And this ran from July of 2020 to April of 2021. So our last round of data is what I'll refer to now. And that showed that about 54% of Canadians uh, reported receiving information from their banks on COVID-19. And nearly two thirds reported being aware of financial assistance being offered by banks. And based on the same survey, we also know that the strongest predictor of taking financial assistance was a decrease in income. At the same time, 31% of Canadians, about a third, also reported paying additional bank fees because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And our data show that it was lower income vulnerable Canadians who were most likely to pay fees such as overdraft fees or non-sufficient fund fees. Thank you, Supriya. Um, Adam, can I turn to you next, please, for the perspective from California? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, when it comes to industry participants responding positively to the challenges of COVID-19, uh, the, the industry we think comes to, uh, to mind, top of mind to us here in California, has been the response from our, our non-bank residential mortgage providers and servicers. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that happened here in the United States and in California in particular is that residential mortgage loan origination essentially doubled uh, during the pandemic uh, because of low interest rates. Uh, consumers uh, made a rush to refinance their existing home mortgages, uh, while at the same time, uh, due to government edicts and regulatory pressure, uh, our, our servicers were essentially had to stop foreclosing upon homes. So if a borrower defaulted upon their obligations, they were not allowed to foreclose. Uh, and even when it came to renters, uh, there was obligations for landlords and, and these other providers to offer assistance uh, before they took any steps for eviction, uh, even when the eviction moratorium was, listed, uh, was lifted. And so even while we saw residential mortgage loans double, right, the activity was off the charts. 
uh, we saw some uh, very interesting statistics on the complaints and the foreclosures. So there's a 68% decrease in foreclosures, uh, even after the foreclosure moratoriums were lifted. And we saw a 19% decrease in complaints. And so it's, it's been interesting as a regulator uh, to respond to this because a lot of our traditional activity and oversight was to the mortgage industry. And so now we see mortgage industry complaints reduced. Uh, in conjunction with that, we saw a huge drop in our payday short-term lending product volume. Uh, that dropped 40% during the pandemic, uh, largely because of access to other government programs, stimulus checks, loan forbearances. And really, I think critical is, you know, payday loans in California are something that folks are typically a brick and mortar. You walk down to a local store to get a short-term loan. And we saw a real growth in what we call alternative financing options, stuff like buy now, pay later, or earned wage access. And so we've really seen a shift from traditional mortgage and payday to kind of a new world of digital finance. And we've had to kind of recalibrate our focus uh, accordingly. That's so interesting. Thank you, Adam. Um, I guess interesting to see if the, uh, the low mortgage complaints continues sort of, you know, in the years to come, uh, particularly with that significant a massive increase in people taking out mortgages and it's interesting to flag buy now pay later i guess you know um paying pay, a lot of regulators and supervisors have paid so much attention to payday lending um uh, rightly because of the risks and as you say that's that perhaps that's gone down in terms of demand but buy now pay later is not exactly free of <laughs> risks to consumers either so it's sort of shifting the uh uh, the distribution channel is changing, but the, the risk profiles are still there. That's, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, and Kirti, from the Mauritius perspective, um, what have you seen in terms of industry practice, both good and bad? Um, actually, um, like Supriya said, well, the pandemic um, brought unprecedented response and collaborations among the operators at large, whether it is the regulators or the operators. So um, basically in the banking system, it was announced and we did see that uh, there was a collaboration on banks to allow for interbank payment withdrawal to be carried out without any additional charge. And this was meant for people to, to be able to withdraw money at the ATM at their proximity without any cost. Um, at the same time, a number of people, a number of, sorry, a number of sessions were held and people were informed on the way of uh, the behavior that consumers should be, especially the more vulnerable ones with respect to adopting modes of electronic payments. Uh, more, moreover, like Supriya said, um, the government came forward with uh, payment deferrals and uh, there was an there was extension in payments for utilities and rentals. Um, there was automatic renewal of insurance policies expiring with premium paid, being paid after. Um, also, according to statistics, um, there was a large pickup of electronic payments means during this period. And uh, irrespective of the previous behavior, whether um, that uh, behavior could be more of a conservative one or that whether that behavior could be more of a cost conscious side, especially for small retailers who initially complained that the charges related to card payments was very high. But at some point in time, it basically forced all the players together into that route. And um, in terms of unfair practices, these were more seen into retail businesses, which were more cash dominant because uh, prices were hiking. Um, in some in instances, we saw that people tend to create artificial scarcity and that was shown. And at the same time, there was an upsurge of attempts for electronic fraud. Um, so some statistics show that people were drawn towards card phishing, but thankfully um, the regulators came up to do some financial literacy with respect to the minimum behavior that people need to adopt during this period. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that issue of fraud is a very interesting one and, and, and there may be questions on that. Um, uh, 
uh, in a while. I mean, I think around the world, we've seen a massive increase in online frauds associated with the pandemic, um, associated with the pandemic and the fact that you know, so many more people are transacting online, it's been a key risk. Um, as we move on to, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So a reminder to um, attendees, feel free, if you have a question, to pop it in the chat and um, I can ask it to our panelists. Uh, but we have plenty of uh, questions and discussion points to be getting on with. And I want to now start um, sort of thinking about looking ahead, sort of where do we go from here? Um, and particularly um, thinking about regulatory or supervisory changes that have been implemented um, as a result of the pandemic experience. So, so what changes were, were put in place um, um, in response to these, uh, to, to these, this situation? And, and Adam, I'd like to come back to you on that, please, if I can. Sure, yeah, I mean, one of the major changes I, I think that we are, uh, we, we foresee and that we're planning to implement, we're already trying to put resources behind, is stepping up our response to consumer complaints. Uh, during the pandemic, I mean, even though we've had a, a drop in activity across some of our traditional financial lines like mortgages and payday, uh, we have still seen a 40% increase in complaints throughout the pandemic. So really just a surge of complaints. I think as, as many of the panelists have spoken about already, uh, just a, a very rapid shift to more digital finance products have really led to more complaints. You know, in particular, uh, some of the hottest areas that we've seen complaints are uh, student loans, that's been a very big one for us, is student loans, uh, people with complaints about uh, how their student loans are being serviced and whether or not they're complying with uh, the new rules for the pandemic on how student loans should be co collected. Uh, all personal loan products, uh, as I mentioned before, we've really seen a shift uh, from kind of more traditional loans to these new alternative loans. And there's, but that raises many questions for consumers who might not understand how these new products work. And so one of the things in California we're trying to do, in addition to monitoring our complaints, is we are really trying to step up our sharing of regulatory expectations with providers on these new products. Uh, a very popular thing has to been uh, in the digital world has been to create new, seemingly new products. Uh, and so we have seemingly new products like buy now, pay later, earned wage access. Uh, we also see a rise in income share agreements, which are loans which are supposed to be tied to income. Uh, we've also seen a big rise in a product called, it's called a shared mortgage appreciation product through which a consumer sells, quote unquote, a percentage of the upside in their home equity. Uh, and we've also seen a, a really large number of complaints related to cryptocurrency. And so one of the things we're really trying to do is step up sharing with these providers what we think the rules of the road are in California. Uh, so that you know we're not dealing with it two to three years down the line. We want to get in front of it, uh, understanding where the market's going, sharing expectations in advance, and really informing what we share with providers based upon a really good review of complaints. You know, letting our folks, our citizens, tell us quickly what the issues they see, what are they encountering, and then turning that back around and turning that into guidance for providers uh, to help avoid some issues. And we've also, you know, as as Jose mentioned earlier, we've had a, we've had a number of complaints arising uh, relating to questionable investments and fraudulent schemes. Uh, we've definitely seen an increase in that. Uh, I, I think just the move to digital allows folks who might not have been on a digital platform previously to be more easily taken advantage of. I would suspect, uh, and so we're really stepping that up. Uh, in particular, we have seen a an increase in the amount of consumers who have been victimized by quote unquote debt relief companies or debt relief agencies. These are companies which purport to negotiate or erase or remove or modify existing debts of consumers for a fee. Uh, oftentimes nothing gets done uh, and they're just built for fees. And so we've really stepped up our enforcement of that, uh, going after companies who, who do that, who, who provide fake illusory services without any benefit and making sure that they're not doing that. Uh, so that's been a real area of focus for us too. Uh, we posted a number of consumer alerts uh, relating to scams involving fake federal and state stimulus payment programs. Uh, we've had a, a number of consumer alerts that have been directed to uh, scammers who sent out fake default notices uh, in order to collect money from consumers, and also just a number of kind of your typical investment scams like fake private placement offerings. And so, uh, you know, in addition to that, like I said, we're stepping up our complaint review. We've increased our staffing. Uh, we've increased our review. We're trying to get higher level and taking away the trends, understanding where it's going, uh, and then sharing that back. Uh, for example, another way in which we've shared that back to our industry participants and our companies 
is we've been giving uh, increased debt collection advisements to companies in California, uh, instructing them on how they should and should not be collecting debt, not just mortgage debt, but general debt in California uh, throughout the pandemic. Perfect, thanks, Adam. So a lot of um, a lot of activity there, and once again, um, you're underlining um, through the use of your enhanced use of complaints data. Uh, the point that Sakria was making at the beginning of the session about the importance of collecting data and, and and making use of it in a regulatory to inform regulatory or supervisory approaches. Um, Kirsty, what about in Mauritius? What have been some of the changes from a regulatory or supervisory perspective that you've put into place at the Commission? Um, it was um, the main regulatory and supervisory changes were implemented mostly by the central bank. So during these days, um, just to recall that Mauritius is and comes under the purview of the National Payment Systems Act, also known as the NPS, which fall under the purview of the central bank. So the central bank did intervene, um, as I have already mentioned, to request banks to waive the interbank charges when it comes, sorry, when it comes to card transactions and uh, for cash withdrawals. So um, also the limits per item transactions, these were relaxed to allow for more electronic transactions to go through. And more importantly is that the payment system, despite the lockdown, continued to operate and showed its resilience. So all these activities were carried out remotely, but the whole of the payment system operated during the pandemic in order to allow interbank transaction to be carried out. So um, as there was the lockdown, um, banks did open during uh, selected days and on selected locations, and uh, albeit for a few hours, to allow people to carry out uh, basic transactions. And at some point, um, sorry, at some time to allow merchants to deposit cash so as they are not prone to theft. So um, at the level of the government, a number of initiatives were taken to limit the, to limit the movement of people, yet to uh, continue on the minimum level of financial activities. So, um, government did continue to pay the benefits, for instance, the benefits to the pensioners, so that they are, have that comfort level of cash to be able to carry out the basic needs. So the main, uh, uh, like say, the main uh, action was taken mostly by the central bank, so as people can still um, do their activities um, and they have that level of comfort with their cash. Terrific, thank you um, for that. Um, and sort of flowing on from that question about changes that have been implemented as a result of the question, but as a result of the pandemic, um, but then looking very much to the future um, and particularly, you know, the digital future, shall we say. So thinking about all the different sort of risks and, and analysis um, and experiences, as well as, you know, what you're seeing sort of generally in the, in, in the jurisdiction, what do you think are some of the key regulatory or supervisory changes, or perhaps we've talked about some changes, perhaps areas of focus or activity that you, uh, your organization will be um, thinking about in terms of protecting consumers in the, in the years to come? Um, and we've got Vasco back in the call, so perhaps Vasco, I could put this question to you first, please. Uh, thank you very much, Myers, and apologies for the problem with the internet here. Uh, I think before uh, I mention some of the questions that we are looking to, I've, uh, I should mention that geopolitics can change, considerations can change everything. So perhaps for anyone watching this uh, session in one, two or three years, uh, may say that now how these people are naive or making these uh, considerations. So everything can change. But I think that in a one year time frame, what we'll, uh, we're going to focus on retail investors about the, the role of the influencers, the social media influencers in these uh, social media trends on, for investments. We saw that uh, a lot of financial institutions are engaging with investors in with new tools, uh, social media tools, and also uh, hiring 
social media influencers to provide advice on or financial information in a, which is what's used consider as as a something boring and now they can uh, make that financial information available and it goes uh, viral uh, very fast so it, it's good but there's some considerations for regulators here and especially uh, with regards to broken dealer supervision. So the digital engagement practices of these broken dealers are offering sometimes game-like features and using behavioral insights to uh, design their platforms to, in to encourage trading, as I mentioned before. So this is something that we are uh, analyzing and I think it's a common, uh, it's a shared concern of among regulators. Uh, in the, uh, I would say, in two, three, four years, I think the crypto um, economy ecosystem will evolve, uh, especially with the central banks issuing central bank digital coins. Soon, we will have a more complete ecosystem for crypto assets trading, so including cryptocurrency, digital currency, sometimes issued by the central bank, and also people investing in security tokens and perhaps non-fungible tokens. So this is something that we are working with the industry here. Uh, there's a law that's been discussing at the federal uh, government, and perhaps the, uh, the regulatory perimeters will be drawn uh, soon. And my last, and perhaps this is a long shot, it's the metaverse economy. Uh, as you know, a metaverse is an immersive, uh, a shared immersive virtual world. Uh, it's, it's nothing new, but uh, the next generation of metaverses are being launched. They are being scaled up by Facebook through Meta and also facilitated by 5G communication. So the traditional metaverses, people are exchanging digital goods, digital services, or digital representation of physical goods and services. But usually the, 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 these assets are there only. With the meta and other platforms, you can have your own uh, NFTs with you and perhaps go to another metaverse. So I think there is a, a likely a trend to financial system to move into these new uh, technologies. And this is something that and it will involve ownership rights and the NFTs as records of digital ownership will be something that we we'll definitely need to pay attention in perhaps in a four to five years uh, time frame. Thank you. Thanks, Vasco. Um, yes, it certainly seems that there's no end to the different um, permutations of um, financial product or product that can be enabled by digital technology these days. Um, and as you say, it's a question of the regulatory perimeter um, um, and, and sort of how capable it is of accommodating these different things. Um, um, and whether you can have broad principles that can be applied sort of at a specific level, rather than necessarily sort of rewriting the law every time a new product comes on the market, which would be, you know, on a daily basis. Um, so very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Vasco. Um, Supriya, can I come to you next, please? Thanks, Miles. So uh, we are busy in Canada working to implement Canada's new financial consumer protection framework which was enshrined in legislation a couple of years ago now. It contains 60, about 60 new or enhanced measures to protect financial consumers. And it, I think, shifts an, uh, signals an important shift uh, in focus from some more prescriptive regulation to regulation focused on better outcomes for consumers, which I think speaks to the point you were just, just making about, you know, are there broad principles, broad principle-based approaches that we can employ. Uh, but if you will allow me to zoom out for a second, I'll say, so, you know, 87% of Canadians now say that they can, can they manage their finances using the internet. 
Uh, so the biggest change in the financial sector, which is of course also the topic of this forum, is, is the digitalization of, of finance. And as per our current as per current projections, we are, we're sort of going to be developing an open banking framework for Canada within the next one year time frame. So this is all very relevant and pertinent to us. And what I'll say there is is that you know the and this is my sort of zoomed out perspective, but the digitalization of financial services, just like the digitalization of most aspects of our social or economic lives is, is not a neutral force, right? On the one hand, new technology brings the potential for innovation to unlock tremendous value for financial consumers and solve seemingly intractable problems to make financial services infinitely more fair, more accessible, more inclusive. On the other hand, technology also tends to create new problems as it solves old ones. So fraud, exploitation, data breaches, algorithms that reinforce stereotypes and increase discrimination. I mean, I could go on, but I think the, the thing that we're really sort of grappling with in, in at the FCAC and in Canada broadly is, is what I'm about to say, which is that innovation is about making the status quo, is about questioning the status quo to make something better. And we need that. But making, making things better for some should not mean making them worse for others. So I will say our challenge as regulators in the next one to three year time frame is really how in the context of digitalization, how do we promote and even foster innovation for the benefits it can bring to consumers in the form of choice, access, inclusion, better product services, while making sure that consumers remain protected, particularly the most vulnerable. And then the second piece I'll add is, given what we've learned over the last two years, how do we make sure that what we've learned from COVID and what it has taught us about the critical importance of banking infrastructure during a crisis? How do we you know, take that and ensure that these new online financial frameworks, if you will, or products, services, don't inadvertently increase barriers to access, again, especially for the most vulnerable. We think the best way to do this is to engage with and understand the financial consumer, either through research that we do directly or through consumer or through engaging with consumer advocacy organizations that can help us understand you know, how, we can, how we can work together to to hopefully find the answers to these, these tough, tough questions. Thank you, Supriya. I really like what you said there about um, technology, digitalization, the benefits and the risks, but it's not a neutral, it's not a neutral force. Um, Kirti, can I come to you next, please, in terms of your views about what's coming up yeah. next? What will the area of focus for the future? Um, indeed, um, from Mauritius, we also see the emergence of other means of payment, basically those related to cryptos, where consumers could be very easily lured to, and therefore they could lose their investments depending on the way people save their products. So um, on the Mauritian context, we do have in trying our laws the requirement to have the consumer education and consumer protection taken both from the banking and non-banking regulators. At the level of the non-bank regulators, we um, have the mandate to, uh, of the Financial Services Commission to carry out financial um, literacy and this is done through the Financial Services Fund, and they have got a full range of programs um, where they can reach out to, um, to the public, um, explaining the need to have a good financial education. So um, institutions seize every opportunity to talk to consumers about risk that happened. Um, for into any product or anything that come into the market. So um, what happens also with regards to the Financial Services Commission, it was not exactly due to the pandemic, but it just came during the pandemic, two new products that aims towards the digital finance of the mass. One was the peer-to-peer -peer lending, and the other one is crowdfunding 
both aim to be disruptors of the traditional banking systems of raising funds and uh, are currently being picking up. So we already have two operators in the P2P and sorry, P2P and one in the crowdfunding. And we see that the literacy is uh, going on. And uh, for the banks, for people to, um, it will help, uh, it will be alternative for banks, like to the banks for people to raise money and even aid um, SMEs with respect to raising funds and doing business. So in future, the regulatory and supervisory changes will continue to evolve. Basically, we take a yearly approach to see what are the regulatory changes required, whether um, it is to protect or the consumers or whether it is to come up with new products that will eventually um, enlarge the financial landscape. So going forward, the commission, the Financial Services Commission is coming with what we call the captive insurance business and the real estate investment trust. And we will also go in the area of licensing and service providers in the crypto industrial assets areas. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kirti. Um... So quite a lot uh, on the horizon for you there. Um, and Adam, um, let me bring that question to you finally. Sure, yeah, and, and echoing some statements I think others have made, which I think are terrific in that, you know, California, I mean, we consider uh, one of our strengths to be our diversity of our communities in California. And, and we believe going forward that one of our, our key focuses and it's something that's gonna animate all of our activities is going to be ensuring that uh, we are providers and that everyone in California is uh, promoting financial inclusion and reducing barriers of access, uh, wh whether it comes to new Americans or student loan borrowers or those who are the most vulnerable, uh, we are going to step up our expectations. Uh, and if we're gonna make sure uh, and do all that we can to make sure that uh, systemic inequities uh, are not furthered uh, by these new changes that we're seeing across the markets, but only reduced. And that's definitely gonna be something focused uh, for us going forward. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, and thank you, everyone. That's um, sort of the end of our sort of um, formal or, or pre-planned questions that I had for our panelists. We've got a few questions in the chat. I think we've got time to respond to quickly. Um, I might try and direct these based on uh, the responses and the comments that our panelists have made. So there's a first question from um, a colleague in South Korea um, asking about... Um, um, asking about whether the development of crypto ecosystems will make financial systems more resilient to future shocks and in that way better protect consumers. Um, and I thought I might direct this question to Vasco and to Kirti because you both specifically talked about crypto. So do you see a, a potential of, of crypto ecosystems to actually play a beneficial role in terms of, I guess, the integrity of the system as a whole and, and, and therefore better consumer protection? Uh, Vasco, I don't know if you've got any thoughts or, or views about that. I think, of, of course, there are risks, but also opportunities. It will depend on the regulation, especially also on law and the regulatory perimeter that needs to be clarified in some jurisdictions. Uh, I think crypto is a reality. Uh, most Brazilians invest in crypto assets, and even with the perhaps some of the geopolitical considerations that I referring to will actually uh, enhance this ecosystem. So it's being developed. Uh, we have a sandbox here at CVM, a regulatory sandbox, and all the four uh, participants were working on crypto, using crypto, uh, crypto to change the way uh, securities are traded, are registered, are priced, so uh, I think this is the, or my, my opinion is the financial system of the future. So we cannot fight the future. We need to support investors and also to the financial innovation. So my last comment is that uh, we, I, thought, I fully agree with the, a new mandate for regulator, which is an innovation facilitator. Uh, our economics needs there and we need to be actually open to financial innovation in many areas. 
I think it will be beneficial if we can handle this uh, complex problem very well. Thanks, Vasco. And Kirti, from your perspective, do you see potential um, in the uh, development of crypto to, to better protect the integrity of the system and the consumer? Well, um, to, to add to what Vasco says, um, this is one part of the financial invo innovation um, ideas that we plan to do. And obviously it is um, cryptos, there are other risks and the regulators here to protect the consumers and by having those um, regulation in place, we are here to ensure that uh, the consumers are safe but in terms of resilience, it, there will be a risk factor because nothing is 100% resilient, but it's just about minimizing the risk and ensuring that um, there is a certain level of uh, protection and they feel safe, like when doing any sort of transaction. So the regulator is here to, to ensure that. And uh, so, with the nowadays, everything, there has been a surge of uh, interest in the cryptos. So the regulator cannot be blindfolded about that. So we need to ensure that we are going with uh, what is happening, what are the changes happening around the world. So in terms of resilience, again, uh, I say maybe it will be, it won't be fully resilient, but just about minimizing the risk. We will ensure that we do minimize the risk, any sort of risk. Thank you. Thank you, Kirti. Thank you, Vasco. Um, another question we've received um, from CGAP, which I thought I would direct to Supriya because you touched on this. Um, the question is, have you found new or different ways to communicate with consumer associations as a result of the pandemic to gain deeper or different insights into consumer risks in the market? So uh, we, um, last year, July of 2021, we launched uh, uh, renewed national financial literacy strategy and uh, strat the focus of the strategy is also very much uh, on outcomes for consumers as uh, so it's very sort of research based very evidence driven and it it has target outcomes in terms of increasing you know financial resilience and it also speaks to actually strengthening consumer protection measures in the strategy itself through the strat so this but the, the reason i bring it up here is the strategy is very much uh, it, it, it endorses an ecosystem approach where we're saying that instead of placing the onus on the financial consumer, rather it, you know, financial outcomes for consumers are a collective or mutual responsibility or shared responsibility, if you will, where the financial ecosystem around the consumer, so the regulator, the government, the financial industry, financial literacy organizations, academics, consumer advocacy, we all have to work together to make sure that we are uh, changing the ecosystem in ways that will facilitate better outcomes for consumers. And those changes are either reducing barriers in the ecosystem or catalyzing actions in the ecosystem. So through this, this framework, if you will, yes, we have started very much to engage very strongly with, with all sorts of consumer organizations. I mean, this was happening earlier as well, uh, but it was more in the context of um, a engagement that was not as much targeted at behavioral outcomes as it now is through the national strategy. And we hope to continue to do this more and more for the next five years through the life of the strategy so we can, uh, we can get some data to see if this approach is, is you know, helping people. Thank you, Supriya. Um, and the, the, the last question I have, which you've actually sort of answered in, in, in the context of, of your answer to that question, but I thought this might, I might put this to Adam, given Adam, you mentioned financial inclusion. There's a question from a consumer rep in the Philippines asking about the challenges and opportunities of a strategy for financial inclusion um, when, you know, when we have significant levels of financial exclusion. I mean, obviously they're different in different jurisdictions. Um, so Peter, you've sort of touched on that, talking about barriers and, and addressing those barriers in the context of what you're doing in Canada. But Adam, in, at a California level, um, as you think about financial inclusion, what, what do you have a strategic approach in mind? Um, how are you proposing perhaps to tackle that issue? Thank you. 
Sure. Uh, there's probably two steps I'd, I'd want to highlight for how we're, we're planning to go about it. Uh, first off is engagement. Uh, we have really stepped up our efforts in, in, in engaging with uh, community members, consumer advocates to make sure that we're seeing what's happening in these communities and to make sure that uh, folks are able to share feedback with us. And so we are changing the way and enhancing the way we're in, uh, meeting with people, uh, open door policies, engaging with folks on Twitter and all platforms to make sure that we're responsive. And we're not just expecting folks to come to us. We're actively monitoring. We're trying to go where consumers are. Uh, so whether that's Reddit or App Store reviews or wherever it is to try to make sure that we understand what's happening in our communities. Uh, but also research. Uh, we're investing in our research capabilities. We've recently hired a research department uh, who's going to be spending time uh, collecting data on how products are used and to make sure that uh, we consider uh, the communities who are using certain products as we go about regulating them. And so before we make decisions on whether or not a product uh, should be tailored in a certain way or it needs to meet certain requirements, we want to make sure we understand uh, who these products are serving. Uh, as we do that. And so for that, we need to have research, we need to have data. And so that's really two steps, engagement and research are two ways in which we hope to better get there. Terrific, thank you, Adam. And that's been a bit of a theme throughout this session. Um, and that brings us to the end of, of this session. I'd like to very much thank uh, the four panelists. Thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts and perspectives um, so generously today. Um, I see a comment in the, in the chat, which I think uh, sort of sums up uh, part of the discussion um, and, and saved me from doing that. Um, uh, Kimira says, we need to scale up safe, transparent and responsive digital services and infrastructures. And I think all of our panelists have sort of touched on that theme very much so. So thank you, Kimira, for uh, helping me to summarize. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I, I think I'm handing back to Matt from Consumers International. Um, Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day, everybody, and a good uh, rest of the forum to Consumers International. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Miles, and thank yeah. you, everyone. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you.